morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I'm Safwan Masri, Executive Vice President for Global Centers and Global Development at Columbia University. Like many of you, I'm joining this event from a distance from New York. In my case, from my home in Amman, Jordan, where I've been since March. I'm delighted to welcome all of you to Columbia University's first University Leadership Forum for International Students with President Lee Bollinger. President Bollinger, we are all very grateful to you for taking the time to be with our international students today. This has been a year like no other any of us has experienced, and it has been especially difficult for our international students dispersed around the world. And so I know that they are all especially appreciative for the opportunity to engage with you. During this unique moment in history, Colombia has had to, to pivot and pivot quickly. And it has distinguished itself among top universities in the scope of its support for students sheltering in place and ensuring a safe campus environment. Because of your prescient vision, President Bollinger, when iron curtains descended and borders became highly sealed, tightly sealed, we have been able through the Columbia Global Centers to insist that our deep presence in the world um, to, to maintain that, we remain connected as a global community. Moreover, we were bold in our efforts to leverage our presence in the world and to be out there bringing as much of Colombia to students in their home cities as we could. Your initiative, President Bollinger, to provide our international students access to study and community spaces in more than 65 cities around the world is just one concrete example of the university's commitment to its international students during these difficult times. At times like these, we all need to feel connected with ourselves and with others. The sense of community has never had as profound a meaning and relevance as it does today. Working with our alumni, colleagues in university life, the International Students and Scholars Office, and elsewhere at the university, and recognizing the ingenuity and energy of our student volunteers, we are connecting our international students with one another, with campus resources, and with New York. And today's forum is about just that, community and connection. Again, President Bollinger, we are very grateful to you for being with us today. To our students, especially the new ones amongst you, a couple of words by way of introduction. Lee C. Bollinger became Columbia University's 19th president in 2002. He is the longest serving Ivy League president. Under his leadership, Columbia stands at the very top rank of great research universities, distinguished by comprehensive academic excellence, an innovative and sustainable approach to global engagement, and the institution's most ambitious campus expansion in over a century. President Bollinger is Columbia's first Seth Lowe Professor of the University. He's a member of the Columbia Law Faculty and one of the nation's foremost First Amendment scholars. Each fall semester, Professor, uh, President Bollinger teaches a course entitled Freedom of Speech and Press. He teaches it to Columbia undergraduate students. He has two new books coming out in 2021, National Security, Leaks and Freedom of the Press, the Pentagon Papers 50 Years On, and Regardless of Frontiers, Global Freedom of Expression in a Troubled World, which is co-edited with Agnes Calamar. Throughout his stewardship, as he has navigated the university's challenges and opportunities, President Bollinger's strong moral and intellectual compass has steered the university to emphasize freedom, scholarship, and trust in our capacity to build communities that are resilient and able to adapt to changing demands and requirements. Communities that are diverse, global, and most of all, uphold the highest standards of justice, ethics, and inclusion. Last week, President Bollinger wrote an open letter to Joe Biden reminding the incoming president that thousands of international students are unable to return to the US, or if they are able to gain entry, they face onerous restrictions that threaten their ability to pursue their academic careers. 
these students are utterly foundational to our pursuit of excellence in American higher education, end quote. President Bollinger will talk to us about why he wrote the letter, the mandate that he gave the new administration regarding Dragonian um, policies implemented by the current administration that must be reversed and why. We look forward to the day when all of you are able to be on Columbia's campus. Meanwhile, we are grateful to and we cherish our network of students all over the world. We will continue to nurture our diverse global community during this time. And we are committed to learning from and enhancing those efforts along the way. It is incumbent upon us to do all that we can to help you feel valued and connected to each other and to the institution. To that end, I would like to turn over now to President Bollinger. Thank you, Safwan. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, so I really appreciate this chance to uh, interact with you. And uh, uh, this is really, really a difficult time. We all know that. Uh, it is especially difficult for international students. Um, we uh, appreciate how hard it is to uh, be a student at Columbia and yet not uh, even be close to the campus. Um, it, so I want to say that um, we are missing you and uh, we really look forward to seeing you as soon as possible. Some of the problems of uh, having you present are uh, the result of the virus, but some of them are the result of policy and choices. And that has been, the, I think, the most uh, frustrating uh, and in many ways difficult part of all of this, because if we just had a different set of um, policies, uh, we could have many more of you present. Uh, Safwan uh, and uh, his colleagues and other people in the university have done a spectacular job of trying to uh, minimize the problems that everybody is facing uh, because of the pandemic uh, and because of the policies and the creativity and imagination uh, that they have uh, brought, that Safwan has brought to this um, uh, crisis is uh, deeply, deeply impressive. We're all very grateful. So I think um, I'll, I'll just speak for a few moments about uh, about Columbia, about things that I think we're trying to do. So you get a sense of, um, of the university, how I'm thinking about things. Uh, speak very briefly uh, about my own work um, and um, a few words about the pandemic and, and then open it up for questions. So Columbia is um, is a unique university. I mean, it, we're all ex I'm extraordinarily privileged to be connected to um, to this great institution. And of course, the location in New York City uh, makes it thrilling uh, as well as um, highly educational. And uh, it's, it's a great, great institution. Over the past, I've been doing this now for 19 years. Uh, the university has had to adjust uh, to the modern uh, world, the world as it's going. And we've had to do a number of things and fortunately we've been very successful. One of the just facts about um, universities is that they have to grow. Um, it's just the nature of knowledge, it expands, more people need to study it, so you need more space, more equipment. You also want more students. Um, you want to uh, continually uh, improve your capacity to share knowledge uh, with students. And that means with students all over the world, of course. And uh, so we've needed more space. And I started out with a, a idea of a new campus in Harlem. Uh, <clears throat> that took five or six years to um, get it through the zoning process and uh, get it ready to go. Uh, it, it was extremely successful. It was a miracle in a way. And next year, the business school will open and that will be mostly the completion of phase one. Uh, it's 8 million square feet of space uh, spread over 50 to 100 years. Uh, and this phase one will be about a third of the um, new space. So uh, Manhattanville, as it's called, uh, is an enormous um, once in a century uh, kind of um, expansion for the university. Each 
campus within the overall university, Morningside, uh, Washington Heights, um, the athletic uh, complex, Lamont Doherty, has also expanded with new buildings on each campus. So it's been a period of, of great, great uh, physical expansion and architectural uh, distinction. We've also had to uh, open up lines of um, development, raising money, and um, this has been a, a great success, two very successful capital campaigns that we've conducted. All of that, of course, is about students and about faculty and our pursuit of understanding and knowledge. As the world has changed, uh, and in particular, as it's become more uh, interconnected, my own field, the internet, um, uh, new communications technologies, uh, opening of uh, markets around the world, um, ease of movements of people and reasons, good and bad for people moving, all of these things have resulted in a much more interconnected world. We could not have had this conversation a year ago. It just would not have uh, been possible. Uh, so, uh, that means that new issues uh, need to be explored, uh, new knowledge has to be developed. Uh, universities which had uh, or always uh, existing within an intellectual framework, academic framework that uh, we think is important, have had to adjust. Um, and you can refer to this as globalization and its consequences for uh, universities as well as for the world, I frequently do. It uh, doesn't matter what word you use, it is a reality and we've had to adjust to it. One of the ways we've done this is through the global centers. Uh, I think we're the only university in the United States that has pursued this idea of just having places um, uh, around the world where we have really extremely experienced and talented um, staff and nice facilities, uh, not for the purpose of having branch campuses, but for the purpose of trying to expand our capacity to understand the world and to bring in uh, people from around the world. So you, international students, and these nine global centers and now the various uh, so-called pop-up centers uh, have been, um, I, I believe, a stunning uh, success. And Safwan has uh, guided us um, in this enormously important venture. And the proof of, of the kind of genius in the, in the idea uh, is being shown right now uh, as we uh, struggle to deal with the pandemic and of course the policies I mentioned at the outset, um, these have provided homes. Uh, substitute homes, real homes, um, in all that that means, and uh, for our students and faculty, and, and that has been a great, great uh, uh, development. On the, um, you know, always trying to think about what new areas or what areas should be, uh, we be exploring more, and globalization I just mentioned, uh, that's a an enormous array of things that we need to know and focus on that we haven't uh, done so before. Um, in Manhattanville, we made a major push for developing um, our work in neuroscience and it's the Mind Brain Behavior Institute, a glorious Renzo Piano building there. And that is now the best center of academic work uh, research in the world on the brain, which is of course um, uh, incredibly exciting and important. Data science, um, um, a number of areas we have uh, made uh, major pushes uh, to try to expand our capacity, um, precision medicine. I could go into those another time, but I, the one I really wanna focus on, which is the newest, is climate change. And we are the first university to say this subject is so important, um, we have to devote more intellectual resources uh, to the study and education of that problem and field. It really is a field at this point. Many parts of the university, uh, School of International Public Affairs, Engineering, Arts and Sciences, uh, Law School, um, of course, Lamont Doherty, 
uh, geosciences uh, have been uh, directing more and more attention to this problem. But we think that having a school with a student body and faculty and the power to make appointments is, uh, is important given the gravity and significance of the problem. So you'll hear more and more about this, but the School of Climate, uh, as we call it, is a major development, the first in new school in a half century. Um, I am extremely um, engaged in trying to uh, better understand and to achieve uh, the role of universities in the world, not only as we have uh, done it now for a century or more very successfully, that is active research in trying to understand new knowledge, but in having that knowledge uh, have an effect on, in the world, having it applied, having it um, uh, actually have an impact. And I call this the fourth purpose of a university. Uh, we have research, we have education, teaching. We have public service, which is something every institution should do, serve your communities and so on. But I think there's more to a university and that is to really engage with the world. Outside partners are needed, and you, um, uh, but you need to be focused on it, serious about it. We do this with hospitals. We do medical schools, do research, teaching, but they also apply that knowledge in the context of hospitals. And we do it in a few other areas, but I'm trying to become, Columbia is trying to become just more purposeful about this. Fourth purpose, and the most recent manifestation of this effort is uh, something called Columbia World Projects. And this is uh, relatively new, led by uh, uh, Nick Lemon and um, by Avril Haines, who is just leaving us to become the Director of National Intelligence in the Biden administration, and Ira Katz Nelson, Provost Distinguished Political Scientist. And those three have really guided this new Columbia World Projects into a very, very important and successful uh, effort to take academic work and work with outside partners and have an impact on the world. Let me say just a few things about my uh, own work and interests. Um, as Safwan said, um, my field is First Amendment, uh, freedom of speech, uh, communications. Um, uh, I've studied and written about this all my career. My father uh, owned and ran a small newspaper in a small town in the west of the United States, so I'm very deeply um, uh, engaged for all my life in, in this area. Um, the things that interest me at the moment are, I suppose, best described as the global, that is, how do we build global norms about free speech, free press, and then the impact of the new technology of the internet on free speech, free press. And um, the Regardless of Frontiers book, which will be out very shortly with Anya's Calamard, is an effort to try to uh, build out a field of global freedom of expression. So that's one. And the second um, example is the book that's coming out that I did with Jeff Stone from the University of Chicago Law School on Pentagon Papers. Every society has to figure out how to allow its government to work in secret, but not to let it be too secret and how to have public, the public informed about what the government is doing. The United States developed in the 1970s a very unusual system where the government can keep everything secret at once, but the press, uh, if it can get its hands on the classified information, can publish it with relative impunity. And the question now is whether the internet and the ability to take enormous amounts of information from the government and to publish it by irresponsible publishers changes that dynamic. And um, uh, the book we have, National Security Leaks <clears throat> and Freedom of the Press is uh, about that problem. And now we're beginning work on a, a new project uh, having to do with uh, social media platforms, search engines, the internet, and whether the traditional ideas of freedom of speech and press can um, apply to this new world or whether we have to uh, amend them in significant ways uh, to, a, to really deal with the spread of disinformation 
hate speech and, and the like. Lastly, let me say, I, I think the pandemic has um, just uprooted all of us, but in obviously very differing degrees. Some people have suffered grievously, uh, others are uh, deeply inconvenienced um, and hurt, but uh, it's had a huge, huge impact. I believe uh, and hoping that next academic year, that is uh, after this uh, 2021 year, we will be back to um, normal, uh, more or less. But um, of course, many steps have to happen uh, for the good between now and then for that to be true. But the university responded with uh, really uh, enormous um, dedication and, and brilliance in shutting down with really within the space of a week. And we've learned and we've uh, accommodated um, uh, ourselves to this new situation. And this fall semester closes uh, with a, a sense, I think, of, of pride and, and some justified satisfaction that our educational process has continued, that it's been safe. Uh, and we've made the right decisions, I hope, along the way. Next semester, we're hoping for a few more people on the campus in the residential halls. Every school, every department, um, every research lab, every class will um, be adjusted to, to deal with this in the best ways we can. I myself have taught, I'm just finishing up my class on freedom of speech and press for undergraduates. Last class will be tomorrow. I did a seminar in person with law school students, so I'm aware, keenly aware of both the, uh, how uh, wonderful it is to continue, um, but how difficult it is in this environment. So let me stop there, Safwan, and um, I'd be happy to take questions from people. Thank you very much, President Boninger. Um, I have a few questions that I'd like to, um, to, to pose to you. Um, and then um, I'll bring some questions that we have uh, received from students. Let me just before I get into my questions, uh, just go back to something that you emphasized and thank you for it. And I want all the students to know that in addition to the nine global centers that you mentioned, President Bollinger, um, including Mumbai and Rio, which have been closed because of the pandemic uh, conditions, but we hope to reopen in January in time for the spring term, um, you know, I'm very delighted that we have students who are taking advantage of the community and study spaces at seven WeWork sites in Shanghai, Shenzhen, Beijing, because of limited capacity at the Global Center, Hong Kong, Seoul, Singapore, and London, in addition to our pop-up sites in Athens and in Tel Aviv, and access to 50, um, access in 50 additional cities to WeWork sites. The uh, WeWork sites in the seven cities that I mentioned are, of course, accessible 24-7. And that is because of the time zone differences, especially with East Asia. And I know that the time zone differences have been um, of incredible um, source of angst uh, for, for students. And I just want them to know that the university has been um, actively discussing uh, how uh, we can help um, you know the students are being heard and just last night uh, we had a meeting in which um, suggested guidelines for faculty to help meet the needs of students who are in different uh, time zones are being made so i just wanted to emphasize this that uh, you know having a space to go to is a great thing and being able to go there at any time of day or night um, is meant to help uh, ease the pain, um, but you know we're, we're trying to do much more than that, and we're appealing to faculty to be sensitive to the time zone differences. Uh, so we'll come back to some of the questions on the students' mind, but let me ask you, President Bollinger, um, Colombia is often seen in the press um, in the context of the pandemic and uh, the great research in epidemiology, uh, public health uh, that is going on. Can you share with us sort of how you see Colombia has been a leader in the battle against the, um, the pandemic? And then maybe even comment about how you see the pandemic reshaping uh, globalization and in particular, the future of higher education. So two related but, but separate questions. Yeah. So um, 
in all honesty, I mean, from my vantage point, you know, I've just been dazzled by the um, way in which every single person has sort of stepped up to the uh, to the moment. This started, of course, with our medical center and the incredible uh, disaster crisis that that uh, underwent. And uh, I just went up there uh, in, I, I forget whether it was March or April, it was just as the hospital was being overwhelmed by uh, COVID patients and the hospital had, the medical center basically had shut down except for treating uh, COVID patients. And um, I was just, um, I mean, I, I couldn't have been more impressed by how people dealt with this and responded and exposed themselves to great risk in the process. That kind of ethos, that, that way of responding, I feel has just characterized everybody more or less uh, going through this. And of course, the next big decision was, do we send undergraduates home? Do we basically uh, close down the university? And that happened in, in March. Within the space of just a week or two, uh, all the classes were online and this had never happened uh, before. People had never, uh, most people had never uh, conducted their classes in this way. And yet that went seamlessly, uh, seamlessly with enormous effort. Then we go into the summer and, and uh, of course we have summer programs and people had to accommodate this and that. But the big problem was how to plan for the fall. How would we do this? I mean, thousands and thousands of decisions had to be made at every single level. Who comes back? How do we test? Uh, what are our policies? How do we conduct our classes? What classes will be in person? How do we do that? How do how many classrooms do we have that will space? Uh, just the amount of effort uh, led by a big task force that would make recommendations and come up with ideas. But I just think everything, uh, every person has sort of stepped up with to that. So the it's the I think the great success of Columbia's response is a sign of a group of people, thousands of people, dedicated to what it is that Columbia does. And I don't want to make the case that Columbia did this much, much better than other uh, institutions. I think um, many institutions uh, responded in this way, which really goes to the strength, I think, of their of the character of what we do. It's just like, I mean, this was a moment when public health and medicine were called to the front lines of the world. Uh, and I would say that the public health community led in part by our public health people and medical people uh, acquitted themselves with great distinction. I mean, I think we, we see even though policymakers often have disregarded to very bad consequences, the expertise that we have developed and the dedication, uh, you have to say that uh, the university world uh, has, has really uh, uh, done well uh, as we would hope. So I, I think it's, that's how I would describe uh, this as a success, difficult as it has been. Um, so on the second question was um, what? The second question was about sort of how you imagine once we get out of this pandemic. Oh yes, that will be affected. Normalization will be affected, yeah. yeah. So I think what we're doing right this minute is the most profound change I can see. Um, you know, Safwan, you and I have talked for years, we set up the Global Centers, uh, how many years ago, 10 years ago or so? Yeah, 12. Uh, 12, yeah. Um, you know, the idea was, these were distant places. I mean, we could talk on the phone, we could travel to places, uh, maybe there would be video conference, but that's very, that was very expensive and hard to do technologically. 
we're now able to connect in this kind of much more personal way uh, and, and you know, communicate um, in these ways that we never have before. And the, it would have happened uh, anyway, but it would have taken years. And uh, the fact that people have adjusted to this is I think profoundly uh, important. I think also uh, there's a lot of talk, of course, politically that uh, globalization uh, will be reversed. Um, my view is it can't be reversed, um, absent some kind of uh, nuclear holocaust of World War III. I think the forces that are driving the world together, good forces as well as bad forces, uh, are just overpowering. Um, so communications, uh, you just can't have a this level of uh, communications throughout the world and not see uh, uh, greater and greater opportunities for creativity, uh, improvement of conditions of lives in the world. Uh, that's a powerful and unstoppable force. It is also true that we have enormous collective problems and climate change is example number one. So it's going to be a, a closer and closer world. That means that international students uh, will, will have been growing, will grow. The importance of, of international students and our students in the United States interacting with it will, will just become more and more significant. You know, there come a point when it, even the concept of international students will change. I mean, it's, we've had in my early life, there would be, you know, international students would come in and take a US education as a basic kind of premise. That's the way it would, would work. Obviously, it was somewhat different from that, but that was the same. Now it's you know, almost the reverse. I mean, there's an enormous amount to learn about the uh, broader world that international students represent, and and international students, domestic students. It it it's almost seems antiquated to even talk in those terms. So these these are powerful, powerful changes that are underway. Uh, President Bonjour, let me ask you one more question, then we're going to turn to some students who will ask you questions directly, and then I'll come back and ask you questions that uh, have been submitted um, either earlier or now on the Q&A. So my question to you is about the future of New York City. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we're talking about international students. I remember a time, I've been at Columbia for more than three decades, and I remember in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, New York City didn't have much appeal to international students. It had a reputation of being dangerous, of, um, you know, a lot of very negative things, and uh, that has turned around. And with um, the excellence at Columbia, it's been a, you know, a, a prime destination for international students. Can you tell us just briefly about what you see in terms of New York City and its ability to um, regain and, and uh, retain uh, perhaps its luster and appeal. Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm completely, totally optimistic uh, about the future of New York City. So however, like you, Safwan, um, but uh, I'm a little older, my wife Jean and I at age 22 got married and we'd grown up on the West Coast and um, I uh, decided to go to Columbia Law School, was admitted. We moved to New York City at age 22, right in the middle, in 1968, in the middle of the um, protests and great agitation, civil rights movement, and a war movement in the US. Uh, Columbia had a really rough time in that period, uh, but the real consequences for Columbia happened because of the decline of New York City in the 1970s. And uh, it was um, it was not a pleasant place to be in the 1970s, and it had profound effects on Columbia. So by 1980, I frequently uh, give little talks about this, Columbia was bankrupt. Um, it had started out with the same endowment as Harvard's in, say, 1950, and by 1980, it had expended its um, its endowment. And in New York City was not, a, as I said, a good place to be. It started coming back. And of course, by the time I had come, it was back, um, returned to Columbia in 2002. Uh, it was already becoming an exciting place to be. 
Um, there's no question that there are serious um, issues for the city. Uh, its budget deficit uh, is huge. It is really going to, I mean, it, it could go bad if the federal government did not step forward to help. So we know that this most recent issue around COVID uh, relief in legislation is extremely important. Uh, there's an argument that people will find this kind of communication um, for business, for education, for whatever, um, the way of life um, in, the, in the future, and you won't need to live in the city, and you can live any place and live in the suburbs, live uh, other places. I, I just don't see that as, as real. I mean, I, I, I love doing this right now. I'm incredibly grateful for it but I want to be with students. I mean, my ideal of an education of a university, we don't often reach this, but my ideal is one professor, one student, um, interacting, uh, reading together, researching together, um, you know, and, and that is the most privileged, powerful uh, thing that can happen in life. Um, so, that need for greater uh, interpersonal density of um, interacting with me, of, of all that goes with that and restaurants and culture and the like. So I, I'm very optimistic that um, I'm confident that New York City will return to its greatness. Good, <laughs> we're, we're counting on that. Um, yeah. uh, President Mollinger and and you know, I mean, just just one more uh, comment on that. Um, New York City is has always been brilliant, and uh, you know, let's not forget that it has undergone. Um, people were saying this in two thousand and one and um, two thousand and eight, and it has rebounded, as you said. Um, so, President Bollinger, I have great pleasure introducing Sean Lee, uh, who's a Columbia College student um, who's in Hong Kong and um, who is actually one of the student volunteers that's helping us with this initiative. So, Sean, uh, the floor is yours. It's nice to see you. I thank you for taking the time to speak to us. Um, so far, the global centers and the WeWork spaces have been instrumental in kindling a sense of community for international students who are unable to return to campus. Um, the Hong Kong space, for example, has been a huge success, and I've been able to keep in touch with my friends, uh, forge new relationships with students from other Columbia schools, as well as interacting with alumni who have hosted events and uh, generously started a mentorship program. So my question is, how can the roles of the Global Centers expand in the post-pandemic world? Yeah, thank you, Sean. So we're thinking about this. Um, as I said in my brief uh, remarks, I feel like this crisis has even more deeply solidified the importance of global centers and the concept of the global centers uh, for Columbia and for other universities. I, I mean, I, and it's an odd uh, thing to explain in a certain sense. That is, um, we all know we can travel any place. Uh, we all know that. Uh, universities are highly decentralized. Uh, by that, I mean faculty sort of conduct their own research and, and uh, decide how to teach their courses. Um, let everybody sort of just figure out how they want to do that. We don't need uh, any kind of offices or facilities or staff or uh, elsewhere around the world. It'll just happen. So that, that's the way some people have thought. And yet there is a magic in having physical spaces that are there to help our faculty and our students uh, interact with the world in all kinds of ways. Gathering, um, aiding in doing research, uh, helping with classes. Uh, they have done this and now in this crisis, they have been literally, and I use the term, Safwan used the term, you may have used it, Sean, They've been homes. It's it's really like Columbia, uh, elsewhere than Morningside Heights and Washington Heights. So what that means is that they have to expand. I mean, there's a management issue. How many can we do? There's a money issue. How many can we afford? Uh, but but there is 
every reason to think that there's no magic in the number nine, there's no magic in the number 20. Um, it's, it's what we can kind of build out and keep this uh, incredible idea uh, going. And uh, so I, I, I'm just thrilled uh, that this has turned into uh, something of a, um, um, of a comfort uh, for international students and others in this time of, of great um, pain and suffering. But it's also proven the concept and uh, they will expand in their physical places and in their functions. Thank you. Thank you, President Boninger. Um, next, we had a question from Lilia Brahim, who's a college student in Tunis and has been using the Global Center there. And her question has to do with being a first year student and being able to be on campus. And actually, what Lilia provides is an answer. <laughs> really, it's more than a question because uh, you've done all the necessary things, Lilia, in order to be able to be on uh, campus. So uh, please present us with your case. And I hope other first year students around the world um, are listening in carefully uh, to know what they can do in order to arrive on campus. Lilia, over to you. Um, so good morning, President Bollinger. Thank you so much for um, this webinar. Um, so I'm one of the many international freshmen who has a visa, has an I-20, has housing on campus, but couldn't move um, because of ISIS policy regarding hybrid classes. So during the past few months, I've been in contact with many international freshmen. And as you've mentioned earlier, that there has been an increasing amount of frustration because we realized that some solutions could be put in place um, to make hybrid classes available to us for visa purposes. But we felt like we just didn't benefit from such possible solutions. So today, and when it comes to next spring, most of us just contacted professors directly and later on registered for hybrid classes. Um, so my question is, when will the university make its official announcement about those hybrid classes? Because we're not like moving across a country, we're literally yeah. moving across the world. And we cannot deal with that much uncertainty when it comes to if we're going to move and when we're going to move. So yeah. So, uh, so thank you really for raising that. And it now gives me a um, stronger sense of, um, uh, of I, I want to look into this more. The, um, the only thing I would say right now is that we are, of course, we're always in this every week, the world changes for us. So we come up with a plan. And we think we can, and we have guide, I mean, we have restrictions and guidelines we have to follow. So the state says, this is how many students you can have in how many facilities and um, rooms and bathrooms and, you know, uh, quarantine and so on. So we, we have to exist within those rules. But even then things change um, by the week and we constantly have to adjust. One of the ways in which we have to adjust is uh, how to get, how to determine which faculty are going to teach in which forms. And this is not easy. Um, as I uh, said now a couple of times, universities are very, quote, decentralized places. And what that means, in fact, is that faculty are really very much in charge of their own lives. And decide what they want, what books they want to write, as I said before, and what uh, lab research they want to do and how they want to conduct their classes. Uh, in this pandemic, we made a decision. I made a decision. Um, I, I don't think I really had any choice, but I, I, in any event, I believe in it, that faculty uh, will decide what modality they will use. And uh, Part of the next question then is how do we get faculty the information they need to make that decision? I would like to see more in-person classes, hybrid classes. I mean, I taught uh, a class this semester, 
small law school class in that way, seminar, 12 students. Um, so I'm very much aware of the uh, pluses and minuses of doing that and of the risks. So we are still in that process right now and will be for the next week or so of trying to find out how faculty will decide what they're going to do in what, what classes in what modality, online completely, in person, um, hybrid, and, um, and, and we will you know, be making announcements for next semester shortly. But this point you make uh, about this is very, very powerful. And uh, I'm glad I, you've said it and I have it in my mind and uh, we all have it in our minds and we'll, we'll try to do our very best. Thank you, President Bonja. Thank you, Lilia. I mean, you know, your question really, every first year student is asking it. And I think your entrepreneurship and <laughs> leading to faculty getting that uh, sorted out and being able to get your visa in I-20 and getting a space on campus. And, you know, for all uh, first year students or any students, you know, you can apply for campus housing on a hardship status basis. Um, and the university will do everything it has power to accommodate you. And uh, as President Bollinger said, and this is to you, Lilia, and to all first years, the university is doing everything it can, working with the faculty to try to provide as many hybrid courses as possible, and we'll keep you informed. On the issue of visas, I just want to say also that everybody should have received from ISSO uh, the spring uh, visa help letter. If you haven't, please get in touch with ISSO. Um, next, uh, President Bollinger, I'd like to turn to Biom Jun Baek. I hope I pronounced it correctly. Um, uh, he's a college student who's from Seoul, um, has been in Seoul, and is now in New York City. Um, and he has a question um, for you about uh, work with other universities on trying to reverse uh, measures. Uh, go ahead, Biom, please. Hello, Professor Bollinger. Thank you for the all the work you've been doing. Uh, my name is June Beck, the student body president of Kalam College Student Council and also an international student from Seoul, South Korea. This summer, when there has been a slate of visa restrictions by ICE, there's been a concentrated campaign and litigation by Columbia its students and its affiliates against ICE visa rules. Although some part of the rule has been lifted, some parts remain, and that's why freshman students cannot come back to the United States. And these uh, freshman students are missing out on important opportunities, friends, and facing time zone problems. With this in mind, what will Columbia University do, along with its peer institutions, to pressure the incoming Biden administration on visas and immigration issues for international students and undocumented students? Right. So, um, so I mean, I would just say we're with you. I mean, I uh, Safwan at the beginning, I think, referred to the open letter that I just uh, sent to um, President-elect Biden. Um, Look, I mean, I'm pretty confident that one of the first things they will do is to change these policies. Um, I can't, um, I know a number of the people who are in positions of, coming into positions of authority, and I know their beliefs and policies and so on, and, and I think we will have a completely different uh, kind of, um, administration when it comes to uh, visas, uh, staffing of consular uh, facilities, uh, and so on. So, uh, you know, I've done, I've tried to do my part. We're continuing to use this open letter as a way to try to get other institutions to join in. Uh, communicating with other uh, university presidents, relying on the National Association, the American Association of Universities to do this. There's a massive um, effort underway. Each of us can, should do what we can personally. I I'm very confident this will change. Thank you, President Bollinger, and thank you, June Beck. Um, so, I mean, staying with that, uh, with that theme, um, I mean, everybody has read the letter that you wrote President Bollinger to President-elect Biden with, with, with great interest. And uh, 
I think everybody appreciates your taking a leadership role, Colombia taking a leadership role in all of this. And it's wonderful to hear that um, you're very hopeful um, about this. Um, and I know that for Chinese students in particular, um, this is one of the drivers behind writing that letter. You wrote a piece in the Washington Post a couple of years ago that's been also very well received in, um, in China. Uh, do you want to maybe speak briefly about, about that in particular and, and what you hope uh, will change perhaps uh, under the Biden administration in particular to this specific issue? So <clears throat> it's been almost um, two years, I think, when I first uh, heard uh, administration officials, high administration officials, uh, begin to articulate this theme that um, American business in particular and knowledge and research um, um, and national secrets <clears throat> were under threat from the Chinese government trying to conduct uh, espionage and theft of um, of information in the United States, intellectual property and so on. So that became a theme. And, and uh, I have no, first of all, I have no deep information in the way that the um, uh, national security infrastructure of the United States uh, does or the uh, police authorities uh, do. I have no deep information about espionage and, and uh, stealing of uh, legitimate, uh, of uh, property. Uh, that said, um, you know, it's incumbent upon uh, administration officials and uh, the forces that we have in the United States, if they have that information and they believe it should be acted on, they, they have to come to uh, the courts and to make that case. There are laws and uh, they are responsible for, uh, for implementing uh, those laws. So I don't have deep information about uh, a lot of this, but there's a system for them to, if they think that there are problems to uh, bring cases. Um, what I do know is that the, um, ways in which this unfolded played upon uh, an ignorance about the way that universities in the United States function and ignorance about why we function in the way we do and on a, a kind of uh, paranoia is the way I put it uh, and a, a, I think a, a dangerous kind of political politicization and demonization of another society. So what I mean by that is uh, government agencies would say to universities, you must stop foreign individuals. And that means international students and international faculty and so on from quote, stealing ideas uh, in from American universities, taking information from labs or um, um, other things that might be quote of value. And as I wrote in this piece in in the Washington Post, you just can't talk that way. Um, it's not right uh, to think of universities in that sense. The way American universities operate, and the way the reasons we have been so successful is because we are open, because knowledge that we pursue is open. Um, and because we take people of great talent from all over the world to our open pursuit of knowledge. I mean, that's a, it's a fundamental principle of universities. We don't do secret work. Uh, everything we do in laboratories, everything we do in, uh, whatever research we do is, is intended to be public. You public, publish books, you publish articles uh, in 
Science Magazine about your research, you, and you bring in people from all over the world and you try to educate them and take their capacities right up to the edge of the knowledge that we have. We don't hide things. And that's of enormous benefit because we um, uh, have decided that, uh, that the expansion of knowledge is good for everyone and it's good for the world and what's good for the world is good for the United States and vice versa. I mean, it's an incredible concept and principle, but it's real. And when you start to say you can't share knowledge, you must keep some group of people out of the knowledge that you're pursuing, it, it violates everything we stand for and everything we do and everything we're responsible for doing and uh, undercuts the very process that is of such great benefit for the society and the world. So um, uh, I think there can be legitimate concerns uh, about stealing of certain kinds of uh, intellectual property. We have laws about that. Stealing of government secrets, we have laws about that. But you can't talk about threats uh, to the society coming from sharing knowledge in universities with uh, international students and faculty. That, that just is a, a violation of all that we stand for. Thank you, President Boninger. Thank you, June Beck. So the last question, and then after that, I will summarize some questions for you, President Boninger. Uh, forgive us if we go over by a couple of minutes. I hope we can. Uh, the last question is from Olivia Feld, um, who is from London. Uh, Olivia? Hi, um, thank you so much for hosting this forum, uh, President Bonninger and, and uh, Professor Marcy. Um, I would, I, I should introduce myself. I'm Olivia and I'm a Knight Badgett Fellow currently between the Journalism School and Business Schools and I'm an yeah. MBA candidate. I would love to know what conversations you've had, President Bonninger, what ongoing conversations you're having with the Biden administration as it pertains to efforts to end all of the travel bans that are impacting your students around the world. Mm -hmm. um, spoken like a real fine journalist. That was, a, that was great. Um, I, you know, the conversations are happening at the, at the level of communications, uh, written communications. I mean, I'm not, uh, you can imagine, I mean, they are so busy putting together uh, this extensive team. There's so much work to be done in reestablishing a real government. I mean, the, you know, all the agencies, all the departments, all the people who have to be uh, appointed, all the work that has to be done to, uh, to you know, re put the whole society and the world on a different footing. I mean, this is uh, one of the uh, most, I think, difficult transitions in modern history. So, um, so I'm, hope, I'm very hopeful that the international things we're talking about, even though small in comparison with major questions like, do we rejoin the Paris climate tree? And what about the uh, agreement with Iran. I mean, there are major questions on the table that um, uh, far exceed, I suppose, the uh, policies about uh, staffing visas. Nevertheless, uh, I think that all of that, how we relate to the world and how it manifests itself in these very particular uh, ways of, of visa policies and, and so on, I, I think they will I'm, as I said, I'm confident they will take this uh, action very, very quickly. Avril Haines is, as I mentioned, I think at the beginning, uh, the new director of national intelligence. Well, Avril is our colleague has been working here for the past two or three years. Uh, I appointed her to head up Columbia World Projects and she um, is into this international world, you know, completely. And I am uh, totally confident that Avril and all her colleagues will, will think that um, uh, these changes have to occur and occur immediately. So I don't wanna, I don't wanna say I'm in daily conversation with um, 
the high administration about these issues. I am speaking out. I know that they will pay attention to all of us. I believe they will change them very quickly. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, um, Olivia, for your question. So President Bollinger, I mean, there are, uh, I think in addressing some of these questions, uh, we've addressed uh, questions that are on the minds of many students, including uh, what one should expect uh, in the future in terms of immigration policies, what one should be able to do in terms of registering for hybrid courses and getting their visas uh, to arrive on campus. Um, other students who are seniors had a question which I'd like to address, um, and that is because of the current immigration policies, they wouldn't be able to take advantage of summer A uh, because their visa would expire. Uh, my colleagues at ISSO are telling me that they're working with the college and with the School of Engineering and Applied Science, and they're trying to resolve this issue for you. Um, and they will be in touch with you, uh, specifically the college and the uh, School of Engineering and Applied Science will be in touch with the students directly. And Bill Chen, uh, you're, one of the question, you're one of the students who put that question um, on the Q&A function. Um, there are some specific questions which uh, I and my colleagues will try to address to you individually. Um, I tried to answer as many questions in the Q&A box, uh, but not all of them, and some of them are uh, beyond my uh, knowledge, uh, things that have to do with uh, health insurance and uh, housing fees and so on. So um, I do hope uh, that most of the questions have been answered. A few of you have also asked about extending the uh, WeWork facilities into the spring. Um, we're working on that. We are assessing utilizations. We're assessing uh, where students are going to be, and hopefully we will be able to um, announce something in due course. But um, I think the uh, you know we will we're committed to continuing to uh, support you in any way um, that we can. So hopefully, um, uh, hopefully we will uh, move in that direction. Um, and uh, with that, I think we've addressed as many questions as possible. President Bollinger, uh, thank you so much for doing thank this. You, I, you know, thank you. I mean, you know, and, and many students commented also in the Q&A how much they appreciate everything that you're doing and your deep commitment to international students. So um, I'll give the floor back to you to make any closing remarks that you would like. So thank you all for uh, being on this. I, you know, it, it's really, even though I can't see most of you, the, just the feeling of, of talking uh, to you and hearing you and thinking of you in different places and uh, is, is really important to me and important to all of us. I, uh, you know, hope there will come a time, some of you may be in my class next year, the year after, some of you will interact with in every, other ways. Uh, it, it's just all, uh, you know, we're all part of this fantastic uh, academic community. And um, it's just a pleasure uh, being able to communicate with you, even in this way. And Safwan, thank you for everything you've done, especially at this moment in making the international student community feel more connected to Columbia. So thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. And good luck on your exams. Bye. <laughs>